In this video, we're going to look at the rest of the digestive system organs. So we will look at the gallbladder, the pancreas, and the small and large intestine. In the last video, we were looking at the liver, and we were talking about how the liver makes bile, and the bile is stored in the gallbladder. The gallbladder is located here, and when the hepatic cells make bile, it will move through the left and the right hepatic duct, and then it will move into the gallbladder through the cystic duct. And the bile will be stored there until it's required for digestion. Once the gallbladder contracts, when food starts to enter the small intestine, it will move out of the gallbladder through the common bile duct, which matches up with the pancreatic duct. And this is where the bile and the pancreatic secretions will enter the small intestine. Now, bile is mainly composed of cholesterol, but remember that from the last video, the liver will also put waste products into the bile. So for example, bilirubin, that's broken down heme molecules from when we break down red blood cells, that yellow pigment will also go into the bile. Over here, we can see our cholesterol molecules, and there are some parts of the molecules that have polar regions. So these polar molecules are going to be attracted to water and the non-polar portion will be attracted to the fat. Because the bile has polar and non-polar regions, it acts a little bit like soap and it will help to emulsify fat droplets. So when we consume fat in our diet, the bile is going to help physically break bigger fat um, droplets down into smaller fat droplets. But it is not chemically breaking it down. So we use the enzyme lipase that will be made by the pancreas to chemically break down our triglyceride fat molecules. Next, we'll look at the pancreas. So the pancreas has endocrine and exocrine functions. So when the pancreas is producing hormones, that is an endo, it's acting like an endocrine gland. And when the pancreas is producing digestive enzymes and bicarbonate molecules that go into the small intestine, that is the exocrine functions. So when the pancreas is producing hormones, the two main hormones that it produces is insulin and glucagon. We make insulin when we're eating food and our blood sugar increases, and we make glucagon when we're fasting and our blood sugar goes down. So insulin helps our blood sugar go down and glucagon helps our blood sugar go up. Now only about 2% of the cells in the pancreas make hormones. And we call these the islet of Langerhans cells. And there are two main types. So the alpha cells produce glucagon and the beta cells produce insulin. Now the acinar cells are the ones that secrete the digestive enzymes. And we have cells also in the ducts that will secrete bicarbonate, sodium bicarbonate. Now the bicarbonate is really important for regulating the pH. So recall that when the food is in the stomach, we produce hydrochloric acid. Now, when those acidic stomach contents move into the small intestine, we have to neutralize that acid. So the pancreas is going to produce bicarbonate that will help, which is kind of like baking soda, and it will help to neutralize that pH. Then the small intestine digestive enzymes and the enzymes made by the pancreas, they can function in a neutralized environment. Okay, they don't function in an acidic environment. Next, we'll look at the small intestine. The small intestine has three major portions. The beginning portion is the duodenum. The middle portion is called the jejunum. And then the final portion is called the ileum. Most of the digestion and absorption is going to happen in the very first part in the duodenum. If we look at a section of the small intestine, we can see that it has a lot of folds. And each of these folds is called a villus. So villi is plural, villus is singular. And each villus also has microvilli. So there is a lot of surface area so that when we are breaking down and digesting our food chemically and mechanically, there is a lot of surface area for absorption to occur. So if this is where the lumen is, our nutrients are going to need to move into each villus and then it will go into the bloodstream. Now, if we zoom in a little bit, 
we can see each single villus has this brush border or micro villi. Each one of these cells, we'll look at an individual cell in the next video, but each of these are individual epithelial cells that also have an increased surface area. So when our nutrients are being absorbed, they will move into these epithelial cells and then they will cross through and go out the other side and then they will join up with a capillary. Every single villus has a capillary and they also have a lacteal or a lymphatic vessel. That's what this green vessel is here. Now, when we absorb nutrients, most things are going to absorb into the blood, but when we digest fat, it is going to go into the lacteal. And then you can see that we have uh, muscle layers, we have neurons that are going to be stimulating secretions and muscle contractions. Now the small intestine will also release mucus, just like the stomach, which helps to protect the lining of the digestive tract, and it will produce some hormones that will be um, involved in regulating the process of digestion, and the small intestine also makes some of its own digestive enzymes. We will look at the detailed process of how we chemically break down nutrients and how they're absorbed in the next video. So let's move on to the large intestine, which is also sometimes called the colon or the bowel. And the large intestine's primary function is to absorb the last little bit of water that might be left in the food. Now, if your food stays in the large intestine for a really long time, you will keep absorbing more and more water from that waste. And then it can actually lead to constipation where it is difficult to have a bowel movement. So it's important to have a lot of fiber, especially soluble fiber that will hold some of the water and it will make it easier to have a bowel movement on a regular basis. Now let's have a quick look at the anatomy of the large intestine. Here we have the last part of the small intestine, which is the ileum, and this joins the beginning of the large intestine. Now the first part here is called the cecum. Off of the cecum, we have the appendix, which has immune functions when we're younger, and the food is going to move in this direction. So this is the right side of the body, so your appendix is on the lower right side of your abdominal cavity. Now, as the food moves up the ascending colon, then it will move across the top of your abdominal cavity through the transverse colon, down the descending colon to the sigmoid colon, and then this final portion is called the rectum. And we can store waste products in this end portion until we go to the bathroom. Then the very last part, we have the anal canal and the anus. And there are muscles here, external and internal sphincter muscles. Now, the internal sphincter is composed of smooth muscles, and this is regulated by the autonomic nervous system. But the external sphincter muscles are skeletal muscle which means that we can voluntarily control those contractions so we can go to the bathroom at an appropriate time. Now, the other important component of the large intestine is the bacterial organisms that live there. So they're primarily bacteria, but we also have some yeast, which are fungal organisms. Now, we have about 300 to 1,000 different species of bacteria that live in the large intestine. And we call that either normal flora or our microflora, and these are extremely important for lots of reasons. Bacteria make up about 60% of fecal matter, and the rest will be undigested waste products like fibrous foods and some dead cells that have shed from the lining of the digestive tract. Now, I want to explain the difference between a prebiotic and a probiotic. So probiotics, if you take a probiotic supplement or you eat probiotic foods, that means there are bacteria in that food, like for example, yogurt or kimchi or sauerkraut. 
A prebiotic is something that feeds those microorganisms. And bacteria love to eat undigested fiber. So it's very important to eat a lot of plant foods that are high in fiber because it feeds our microflora. So a few functions of our gut bacteria or our microflora, they help us digest food. So like I just said, they will digest fiber and they can make small chain fatty acid molecules that can be easily absorbed into the bloodstream in the large intestine. Those small chain fatty acids are used by lots of cells, particularly in the brain, to make energy. Microorganisms are also really important for regulating our immune response. Particularly when we're younger, our immune system starts to be regulated by microorganisms that live in our digestive tract. And these microorganisms are important for teaching the immune system what molecules it should react to and which ones it shouldn't. Like we shouldn't have reactions, immune reactions to food molecules. So our microflora is important for helping the immune system to regulate properly. Our microflora also help protect us from pathogenic organisms. They're very territorial and they produce molecules like lactic acid that will alter the pH, which can help to kill off pathogenic microorganisms. Our microflora will also produce some vitamins like B vitamins and vitamin K. Vitamin K is important for blood clotting and we use B vitamins to make ATP. Our microflora also help to stimulate the regeneration of our intestinal cells. So having healthy gut bacteria will keep your intestine cells very healthy. Our normal flora also help to release minerals from our food. So plant foods, um, they will contain molecules like oxalates or phytates, which are molecules the plant uses to hold minerals in the plant cells. So when we eat plant foods, we need to be able to release those minerals. So our normal flora help us to get minerals out of our food. And one other cool thing that our bacteria can do is they can break down carcinogens. So for example, if you have uh, a little bit of burnt toast or if you barbecue meat, the charred black um, component, that is slightly carcinogenic and our microorganisms will help to break those down. So having healthy gut bacteria can help reduce the risk of getting cancer. Okay, so the last component that I wanna look at in this video is let's look at what are the digestive enzymes that are made by the small intestine and the pancreas and how do they break down food? So let's just have a quick reminder of the different kinds of macromolecules. So our macromolecules that we are going to be eating with our food are proteins, triglycerides, which is our fats, and this can be saturated or unsaturated. So it can be oil or it could be like butter. And we will also be consuming nucleic acids. Anytime we are eating a plant or an animal cell, it will contain DNA and RNA and we can digest those. And then we also consume carbohydrates. So complex carbohydrates would be our starch and our fiber. And then our simple carbohydrates are going to be sugars. Sucrose, is composed of glucose and fructose. This is our table sugar. Lactose is composed of glucose and galactose. This is found in milk or dairy products. And then maltose is two glucose molecules. And this would come from breaking down starches. When we break down proteins, they are going to be broken down into amino acids. These are the building blocks. Triglycerides, when we chemically break down fats, we are going to be releasing glycerol molecules and fatty acid chains. When we break down DNA and RNA, we get nucleotides. And then our starchy foods are composed only of glucose. Now, the next chart looks a little bit daunting, but it's not that bad. Okay, so in the last video, remember we talked about how the stomach produces pepsinogen, right? So pepsinogen is cleaved by hydrochloric acid to become pepsin, and pepsin will digest proteins. Okay, and we also talked about two enzymes that are made in the saliva. Okay, the salivary glands will produce amylase, which will start to break down starch in our mouth, and lipase, which breaks down fat. 
Okay, so we've already looked at those. Now we're just going to focus on what is the pancreas making and what is the small intestine making. So here we have our saliva enzymes, amylase and lipase, that break down starch and fats. In the stomach, the only enzyme that is produced is pepsin, which will start breaking down protein. Now the pancreas makes several different enzymes. So the exocrine functions, it's also going to make amylase and lipase that is exactly the same as this amylase and lipase that we produce in our saliva. And the amylase breaks down starch and lipase breaks down fat. Now we can break down RNA and DNA from eating plant and animal cells with ribonuclease and deoxyribonuclease. And then these last two, well, three molecules, are trypsin, chymotrypsin, and carboxypeptidase. Now these two will break down proteins just like the pepsin that started this process in the stomach. So trypsin and chymotrypsin will start breaking proteins down into peptides. Peptides are just strings of amino acids that are maybe 20 amino acids long. So it's a small fragment of a protein. Whereas a whole protein, say you're eating chicken, then a whole protein would be maybe 300 to 500 amino acids. Okay, so as we start breaking down proteins, they are going to become smaller and smaller until eventually we have very small peptides, maybe three to five amino acids or individual amino acids. And then our small intestine primarily breaks down our sugars but it will also produce peptidases that will break down our peptides into smaller and smaller peptides or into individual amino acids. Now, the sugar digesting enzymes are named by the sugar that they break down. So sucrose is broken down by sucrase, lactose is broken down by lactase, and maltose is broken down by maltase. So when it has ASE, then you know it's an enzyme. When it has OSE, then you know it's sugar, okay? And those are the enzymes that we use to break down our macromolecule foods into our nutrients that we will absorb. In the next video, we'll look at the details of how we absorb different nutrients in the digestive tract.